Today's scripture reading is come, actually, it's, one is printed in your bulletin, but the story of Huldah is told in, in, Second King, in Second Chronicles, but also in Second Kings. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to intersperse some telling of the story and some reading of the verses so that I don't read that much. Okay. So this reading tells of events during the, king, the reign of King Josiah. Josiah's reign comes in the 7th century BCE after David and Solomon and before the Babylonian exile. Josiah was only eight years old when he inherited the crown from his father, who was murdered by palace servants after ruling for only two years. When Josiah became king, he followed a period of great apostasy led by his father and grandfather, but Josiah's teachers were faithful to Yahweh and under their influence he began major religious reforms. So, Joshua was eight years old when he began to reign. He reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord and he walked in the ways of its ancestor David. He did not turn aside to the right or to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was still a boy, he began to seek the God of his ancestor David, and in his twelfth year he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places. In his presence they pulled down the altars of the Baals, he demolished the incense altars that stood above them, he broke down the sacred poles, and he carved and the carved and cast images. In the 18th year of his reign, the king ordered the high priest Hilkiah to use the tax money that had been collected over the years to renovate the temple. In the midst of this work, Hilkiah discovered an ancient Torah, the books of the law of Moses. This unique Torah scroll had been kept in the Holy of Holies of the temple, but in the time of the idol-worshiping kings, the upright priests had moved it from there and hid it in a secret place in the temple. When Hilkiah came upon this hidden scroll, he gave it to the king's scribe, Shaphan, to take to the king. The king told Shaphan to read from it, and it so happened that the scroll opened at the section in Deuteronomy containing the admonition where God warns the Jewish people of the terrible consequences that come from neglecting the Torah and the commandments, which would lead to destruction and exile. The fierce anger of the Lord was coming against Judah because the people had rebelled against Yahweh and had not obeyed his commands. The king was deeply shaken and heartbroken remembering how his father and his grandfather had lived. He rent his clothes, which is a sign of mourning and repentance. He ordered Hilkiah and four more royal messengers to inquire of the prophet Huldah whether the message found in the book was authentic. Go, inquire of the Lord for me and for those who are left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words of the book that has been found. For the wrath of the Lord that is poured out on us is great because our ancestors did not keep the word of the Lord to act in accordance with all that is written in this book. So Hilkiah and those whom the king had sent went to the prophet Huldah and spoke to her to that effect. And she declared to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Tell the man who sent you to me, Thus says the Lord, I will indeed bring disaster upon this place and upon its inhabitants, all the curses that are written in the book that was read before the king of Judah, because they have forsaken me and have made offerings to other gods, so that they have provoked me to anger, with all the works of their hands, my wrath will be poured out on this place and will not be quenched. But as to the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus shall you say to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, regarding the words that you have heard, because your heart was penitent, and you humbled yourself before God when you heard his words against this place and its inhabitants. And you have humbled yourself before me and have torn your clothes and wept for me. 
I also have heard you, says the Lord. I will gather you to your ancestors, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace. Your eyes shall not see the disaster that I will bring on this place and its inhabitants. And they took the message back to the king. May these words be to us our light and our life. In the movie Duck Soup, Groucho Marx famously asked, who are you going to believe, me or your own eyes? The reference seems a pertinent one because once again, events of this past week have shown us that we have indeed landed in the soup. <laughs> and we're here because we live in an era when a whole slew of politicians and policymakers and pundits are telling us not to believe our own eyes or our own ears, but to hear a word, or uh, to hear, believe instead a world constructed by their lies. They tell us over and over again because they know that every time they do, the lies start to sound a little more like the truth. So-called alternative facts take hold, creating an alternative reality. And the next thing you know, some bozo opens fire on a DC pizza restaurant because he believes Hillary Clinton is running a pri child prostitution ring out of it. There's a word for this kind of crazy, and that word is post-truth. Every year, the Oxford Dictionary picks a word of the year, one that is judged to reflect the, the mood, the preoccupations, the ethos of that particular year. In 2016, such an auspicious year, in 2016, the word was post-truth. And it is, of course, still going strong. Post-truth politics, also called post-reality politics, is a political culture that bypasses debate in favor of appeals to emotion and to personal belief. Talking points are repeated endlessly, they're asserted even after they've been refuted by the facts. Post-truth practitioners try to compel someone to believe something regardless of evidence to the contrary. A post-truth regime attacks science, declaring that there is no such thing as subjective or as objective truth. During the George W. Bush years, an aide actually dismissed the reality-based community, I think that's us, the reality-based community as no longer important in politics. He said, you believe that solutions emerge from your judicious study of discernible reality. That's not the way the world works anymore. We're an empire now. And when we act, we create our own reality. In other words, <laughs> reality is constructed through the exercise of power. Let that one sink in. Reality is constructed through the exercise of power. And at this point, some of you have got to be thinking of Orwellian doublespeak, language that deliberately hides distorts or reverses the meaning of words. In an essay that George L. Orwell wrote, I think in 1949, called The Prevention of Literature, he wrote, from the totalitarian point of view, history is something created rather than learned. A totalitarian state is a theocracy and its ruling caste, in order to keep its position, has to be thought of as infallible. Has to be thought of as infallible. But since, in practice, no one is infallible, it is frequently necessary to rearrange past events in order to show that 
a mistake was not made, or that some imaginary triumph actually happened. He didn't say anything about the size of inauguration crowds, but the, <laughs> that this imaginary triumph actually happened. Totalitarianism demands, in fact, the continuous alteration of the past. And in the long run, probably demands a disbelief in the very existence of objective truth. Demands a disbelief in the very existence of objective truth. So that's post-truth. And it begs the question, what then is truth? Is it an objective reality, a fixed value residing somewhere in the nature of things or the mind of God? Or is it just a word, the meaning of which changes relative to time and place and social context. Don't worry, I'm not going down that rabbit hole. <laughs> but whether or not truth is relative, I'm going to plead for common sense. A common sense understanding that truth is more than the purely personal. Two and two make four. Gone with the Wind is a book and a movie. World War I was still being taught, fought a hundred years ago more than purely personal truth. And all of this is a roundabout way of saying truth matters. And I'm assuming it matters hugely to you and that perhaps one of the reasons you are here today is that after a week of post-truth politics and, that, and because you're still a part of the reality-based community, you want to hear something that you can affirm to be true. But that begs the question also, how do you know? How do you know what's true? That was Josiah's dilemma. He had a scroll that had been found in the temple. Was it the real deal? For an answer, he turned to Huldah. Huldah is one of seven prophets in Israel. We don't know very much about her. She lived during the reign of Josiah. She was married to a kind man, and she was a prophet. But she did something that no other prophet did. She verified the truth of the scroll found by Hilkiah in the temple. And in so doing, she asserted the authority of the written text, the authority of the written text. Biblical scholar Claudia Camp puts it like this, Hulda's story is notable in the biblical tradition in that her prophetic words of judgment are centered on a written document. She authorizes what will become the core of scripture for Judaism and Christianity. Her validation of the text thus stands as the first recognizable act in the long process of canon formation, deciding what's in the Bible and what isn't. Huldah authenticates a document as being God's word, thereby affording it the sanctity required for a text as authoritative. Okay, so Hulda points us to the written word, which by a long process has come down to us as the Bible, a book that through stories and poems and parables regard, recorded human experiences of the divine. Is it the literal truth? There are those who think so. I don't. Frankly, the Bible itself seems to make a case for truth as relative. After all, it is a book famously in conversation with itself, sometimes taking one view, sometimes taking the opposite view, depending upon the circumstances. And if you want more about that, see Foreign Wives. But it's not the literal truth. 
If it's not the literal truth, can it still be authoritative? That's the key question. Can it be authoritative for us? Is there still some common sense truth to be gleaned from the Bible? Well, can these words help us to understand the times in which we live? When we hear them, are we inspired to act? Because in a deeper sense, the truth of the Bible is found in how it works within us and how we respond to it. Josiah heard the words from the scroll, scroll and from Huldah and he knew them to be true because he recognized himself and his idolatrous predecessors in the text. He knew where he stood historically in relation to its warning and he despaired because he understood that Israel had acted in ways that had broken its covenant with God and that consequences now would follow. An aside about God's wrath. We have free will. A God who does not interfere in our choices does not interfere in the consequences of our choices either. As Paul famously put it in his letter to the Galatians, what you sow, you reap. Okay, end of the aside. So Josiah heard the words from the scroll and he was moved to act. And the rest of the story is told in 2 Kings 23. And I'm reading from that now. Then the king directed that all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem should be gathered to him. And the king went up to the house of the Lord, and with him went all the people of Judah, all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests, the prophets, and all the people, great and small. He read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the house of the Lord. The king stood by the pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord, keeping his commandments, his decrees, and his statutes, and with all his heart and with all his soul, to perform the words of the covenant that were written in this book. And all the people joined in the covenant. Okay, so he located himself and his people in the words. He felt himself called to act, and he instituted reforms that transformed the religious life of his people. It would not be enough to avert the disaster that was come, but it ensured the well-being of his people during his lifetime. Yeah. The Bible is not without problems. But people for centuries have found in it words that somehow find us where we are, that address us personally in our habits and in our relationships, our losses and our jubilation. They address us corporately as a church and as a nation, calling us to recognize the times and the circumstances in which we live and to discern what we are called to do. The story of the scroll's discovery addresses a time when Israel was coming out of a long period of apostasy, when they had abandoned the God of their forebears and turned instead to idols and false gods. They had lost sight of their principal text, a text we should emphasize that was as, is as much about instruction in governance, in civil governance, as it was instruction in religious practices. It laid out the laws for how the people were to live together equitably, treat each other fairly, settle disputes, care communally for their vulnerable members, and treat newcomers. It had been hidden away for safekeeping for fear that an unscrupulous king, the person ultimately responsible for upholding it, would instead destroy it. We 
live in an era, politically speaking, of apostasy and the abandonment of democracy and its principal text, the United States Constitution. We can either hide that document and try to ride out this period of apostasy, or we can find it and use it as a call to action. In answering that call, we can be guided by a more ancient text, one that records the rise and fall of many empires, and one that has lit many a fire of resistance. It has its culture-bound laws that mean little in modern society. It has its flaws and its contradictions. The Bible itself has been a victim of post-truth. Its message perverted by slaveholders in the past and attorneys general in the present. But once we stop looking for truth with a capital T, we find enduring truths that stop us in our tracks, that call us forward, that strengthen us for the road ahead. Whatever your overarching theme that you use to unlock the Bible, whether it's love, justice, liberation, transformation, each testament has a word or phrase that manages to sum it all up. The prophet's admonition to care for the widow, the orphan, the stranger, and Jesus' frequent references to the neighbor. Both Testaments stand up to empire. Both teach a different understanding of power. Both offer guidance for how people are to live together equitably, treat each other fairly, settle disputes, care as a community for our vulnerable members, and how we are to treat newcomers. Both offer ways that I think are best summed up by the way of God or the way of Caesar. Both ask us to choose the way of God or the way of, service, of Caesar. And I think I'm on firm ground when I say that post-truth is not the way of God. There is a sense shared by many today that these are dark times with no end in sight. But I have a friend who loves the verse from Psalms that says, Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. And this is why he loves it. For us to take the next step, it doesn't, it's not necessary that we see the whole path. What we need to see is where to put our foot next. Where do we take the next step? We don't know the future. We cannot escape the times in which we live. But we are not helpless. We can choose how we will respond, and we can choose to hold each other up. And we can take the next step. There is enough light for that. And that's the truth.